Now, good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you. And I count it a privilege and I'm thankful to the believers and that attend the Midland Park Gospel Hall for giving me another privilege to be able to share the gospel message with you. I'd like to read first in the New Testament and then turn to the Old Testament for the primary text I would like to use and to share with you this evening. We'll read in Ephesians chapter 5. If you have a Bible and you want to follow along, it's Ephesians chapter 5. And I'll be reading from uh, verses 5 and 6. Ephesians 5, verses 5 and 6. It says, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, that's a sexually immoral person, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So those are people who will not be in heaven. Then he goes on to say, verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of, because of these things, the wrath of God, because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Because of these things, Cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Now, that's just kind of a background text that I'll hopefully make reference to later on. But I want to read now some words in the, the book of the Psalms, in Psalm 88. Psalm 88. And we'll read verse 7. Psalm 88 and 7. The speaker here says, Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. Thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah. Again, the text says, Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. But I would like to focus in just on these words. Thy wrath. This is a man praying now. He's talking to God. And he says, Thy wrath lieth hard upon me now when we come to the bible we realize that for example in the book of the psalms there are statements that we absolutely have no doubt that they reply to the lord jesus christ so for example you will find that the lord jesus the bible in psalm 22 talks about they pierced my hands and my feet and we know from the New Testament, John's gospel confirms it, that that was actually talking about the Lord Jesus. So there are examples where the Bible actually, so long before, speaks about what is going to happen to him. But at times we come across language that a person is using to describe their experience. But really that language, when you imagine the Lord Jesus, or maybe he actually did speak those words, we are sure that they describe his experience in a far greater and a far more real way. That's what we have here. One of the classic examples of this is found not in the Psalms, but in the lamentation of Jeremiah. And in chapter one, he is looking at his beloved city of Jerusalem that's being destroyed right in front of his eyes. And he turns and he says, he just feels so awful. And he says, behold and see if there's any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which the Lord has afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. And now we love to take that language and, and we could just imagine the Lord Jesus speaking that language and how much real it is, how true it is. If he were to say from the cross, behold and see if there's any sorrow, anyone who's ever suffered any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which the Lord God has afflicted me and the day of his fierce rain, anger. Now that's what we have here. In Psalm 88, it's as if the Lord Jesus is speaking and he says, thy wrath, he says to God, thy wrath lieth hard upon me. So I'm going to speak to you first of all about the anger, the anger at the cross. No, I'm not talking about the men who were angry when they were angry with the responses that the Lord Jesus gave, and they, they beat him, or they whipped him, 
or they made a crown of thorns and the people were angry at him. I'm actually talking about the anger of God because this, this man is saying, talking to God, and he's talking about thy wrath, the anger or the wrath of God. Now, what's the reason? What is the one reason? Because there's only one reason for which God gets angry, that he expresses wrath. You know, there are things, there are things in life that irritate us, but they're not wrong. Right? And sometimes we get angry about things that irritate us. Maybe you're one of those people that gets angry when you're around somebody who's eating and they're chewing with their mouth open. And it's just grating on you and it's irritating you. And you can feel your blood start to boil and you're angry. But the person didn't break the law. And the person didn't sin against God, chewing with their mouth open, may not be nice, may not be pleasant, may not be a good social habit, may not be a way to win friends and influence people, but it's not wrong. God only gets angry at things that are wrong, not at things that irritate, things that are clearly wrong. That is precisely why I took time to read Ephesians 5. Because there it talks about, well, don't let anybody give you the wrong idea, he says. Because of these things, because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. It's because they're characterized by disobedience in their coveting and in their sexual immorality and in their, and their idolatry and their uncleanness. Things that are wrong, things that are sinful because of these things. The wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. So there is ever, you will only find in the Bible, one single reason for the anger of God, the wrath of God, the punishment of God. It is always because of sin. And there's no other reason. Now, let me just remind you about the righteousness of his anger. Not just the reason for it, the rightness of his anger. You see, God never gets used to sin. I don't know whether you are one of these people or have been around these kinds of people, but there are people who cannot speak almost, it seems like, they can't speak one sentence without including a swear word, some obscenity. And they either start the sentence with it, they end it, or they use it, and, and they just use it all the time. And if you say to them, do you realize, they'll say, oh, well, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't. I, I didn't know. They just have gotten used to that kind of language. Likely their friends or their family, they use that kind of language and they become used to sin. Some people get used to living in sin, used to telling lies, and it no longer bothers them. We can get accustomed to sin. But I want to remind you that God, he never gets used to sin. Never. Because of these things, always. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, you will find a God who always responds to sin with anger, with wrath. It is offensive. It is wrong. It is breaking God's law. But the other thing that happens sometimes is we can get angry with sin, but depends on who it is who's sinning. So, for example, in the Bible, there was a man. He was a kind of a senior citizen. His name was Eli. And Eli had a couple of sons. He was a priest, and his sons worked at the uh, there in the, the tabernacle. And, and when they were gathered together at the place of worship, his sons were actually robbing from people. They were committing sexual immorality, and, and they were, it was just awful the sin. It was very grieving. It was very saddening. And Eli likely felt that, but he didn't say anything. He was soft on sin when it came to certain people. Sometimes that happens in a family when there's favorites. Listen, God is never soft on sin. He always responds the same way. His wrath will come upon the children of disobedience, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. No matter who you know, no matter what you know, no matter what you've tried to do, good or bad, the wrath of God cometh. God is never getting used to sin, he won't get accustomed to you sinning, and he won't be soft on your sin. You say, well, after all, we're all made by God, and so surely God will have, have be soft on our sin. Never. 
He will never be soft on sin. But just to balance that, speaking about the righteousness of his anger, God will never over, overreact to sin. I remember, I'm thankful my dad, he didn't re overreact to something I did when I was a boy. I remember one day he was painting some molding along the around the door, and he had a cane of paint, and he took the lid off, and he was dipping his paintbrush, and I came flying around the corner. I was running. I was about four years old, and I came whipping around the corner, and I had the, I can still picture the little red slippers they got me, and I stepped right in the lid of the paint, but I didn't realize it. I just kept motoring, and my dad was yelling, but I kept going. And I kept going around the house on the wood floors and up the stairs. You can see where I went, okay? But my dad realized I was just being a boy. I didn't do it intentionally. I wasn't being rebellious. Rebellious, I was just being a boy. He didn't overreact to what I did. And God will never overreact. We have seen that he won't be soft. He won't underreact. We have seen that he won't get used to sin. And we have commented now that he will not, he will not overreact to sin. And that's what bothered me the night that I got saved. I came to face the reality, what about my sin? And I realized it is not just that God being almighty God could put me in hell. It's that God should put me there. That would be the right response to my sin. I'd never thought of that before. When it dawned on me how awful my sin was, I realized God has every right and God has every responsibility to pour out his anger, his wrath, his punishment upon me. His anger always for, for the reason of sin. And his anger is always right. What about, what about now when the Lord Jesus was on the cross? What was the reason for his anger there, the reason of God's anger? The Lord Jesus said these words, thy wrath, thy wrath. Why God's wrath? It's because of sin. Because of sin. Who sinned? Well, it wasn't the Lord Jesus sin. He had none. And he couldn't sin. It was because of my sin. That's what I came to understand. It was for Christ died for our sins. In the righteous wrath of God was poured out in the holy response, the divine response to our sin against God. And so he speaks about thy wrath lieth hard upon me. But I would like you to think as well about the awfulness of the cross, not just the anger at the cross, the awfulness of the cross. He says, thy wrath lieth hard, lieth hard. What does that mean? Sometimes we use language and the image that we create with our, our language, our speech, or our writing creates an image, but the image, the reality is not as bad as the image. So, for example, if um, I'm not saying this ever happened, but maybe it did, that I got a notice from a teacher when I was a student, and the teacher said, I just want to tell you, you failed the test. I could go home and say to my parents, you know what? I, I, I just was shocked. The teacher came in. He actually told me that I failed the test. It hit me like a ton of bricks. That's quite an image, isn't it? You picture this truck backing up and the dump truck is going up and, and, the, and he pulls the lever and 2,000 pounds of cement and clay comes rumbling down upon a person. Well, Compared to failing a test as serious as that is, without taking away from the seriousness of maybe failing an exam, that's not as serious, really, as 2,000 pounds of brick tumbling down upon you. One would kill you. The other one, maybe just you got to repeat a class or something. You see, the image that is created with a language it is a lot worse than the reality. Could I tell you today, please? That when the Lord Jesus says, thy wrath lieth hard upon me. The reality is actually worse than the image. The reality is worse than the image. Now, how is that? 
Well, this word lieth upon me is the idea of a weight that is placed upon a person. The weight that comes down upon a person or an object. And of course, the people would understand this kind of language because the Jewish people every year in the Bible, they would celebrate a feast, a festival called the Day of Atonement. And on that day, there was there were two goats that were used and one of those goats came to be known as the scapegoat. And that goat was taken and the, the leader, the spiritual leader, the high priest, he would take that goat and he would put his hands on the head of the goat. And then what he would do is he would start talking and he would start confessing all of the sins of the children of Israel during the past year. And while he was doing that, the man would lean all of his 180, 185. He was big man, 200 pounds. Maybe he was super overweight, more weight. More, all of his weight would come down upon that little goat. And all the weight would lie hard upon him. And you picture the poor little animal with his massive man and all of the weight coming down on this goat. Let me remind you that when it came to the cross, the image that this language creates in the minds of a Jewish reader is not near what the reality was at the cross. I'm speaking to you now about the awfulness of the cross. You see, the Bible uses various descriptions. For example, the Lord Jesus himself. He mentioned a verse in the book of Zechariah. A Waco sword. There was going to be a sword that would come down. The sword of justice that would cut into him deeply. That's quite an image. He talked about a cup of the wrath of God that he would drink. And there would be, it would go right down into the very inner part of his being. He said, I have a baptized baptism with which I need to be baptized. It was if he would be in the wrath of God, he was going to be dipped in it, submersed in the wrath of God. Here in this verse, he says, all thy ways, they have afflicted me. It's been like a flood, like a tsunami. The waves, the pounding waves of the wrath of God have slammed into his holy soul. The judgment, the punishment of our peace was upon him. And he can say, thy wrath, the weight when the Lord God laid on him the iniquity of us all, the weight of his of sin, of my sin, it was laid upon him. And the wrath of God lie far greater than a 200, a 300, a 400, a 500 pound man putting all his weight on a little goat. The wrath of God and all of its burden and all of its weightiness. All of that as the right and the, the, the reasonable and the righteous response to sin. God poured out his wrath. All the off, you say, well, wouldn't it be worse? Wouldn't it be worse to, well, that's where that language comes in that I quoted in that other verse. The Lord Jesus could have said, look unto me. He said, behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which the Lord has afflicted in me and the day of his fierce wrath. The day of his fierce anger, when God dumped out his anger upon the Lord Jesus for sins the Savior had never committed. Oh, the oh, you say, well, wouldn't it be worse if there was somebody who was suffering in hell? I cannot compare those two, but all I know is this that the suffering of the Lord Jesus was infinite. And it was he was bearing, he's the Lamb of God that beareth away the sin of the world. His experience was far worse. Oh, the awfulness of the cross. Thy wrath lieth hard. But then there's the last part of that verse. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. I want to speak about the aloneness, the aloneness of the cross. Thy wrath lieth hard not upon us, upon me. It's interesting. 
when you go through the Bible, for example, when God had a task for Noah to build the ark, he gave him three sons. And those three sons could help him with that task. When Moses was facing stress with all of the questions of the people, God provided his father-in-law, and then there were counselors who were there available to kind of, kind of distribute the stress and the responsibility among a number of people. When King David, he went into battles, we are, we are told about 30, 31, is it? Mighty men. Men he could count on to go in there with him. In the New Testament, we come across the Apostle Paul. What did he describe? God provided to him, for example, when he was when he was suffering for the gospel and he was in, incarcerated, he wrote about Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, and Adronicus and Junia, my fellow prisoners. There were other people who were who were in the same boat or in the same prison. They, they were in the same circumstance. At least they could identify with him. But when the Lord Jesus was under the wrath of God, there is nobody who will really be able to identify who has experienced the same thing. His experience was unique. There were no fellow prisoners, if you will. But then Paul also talked about people when he was defending when he was defending the faith, he talked about Archippus in the book of Philemon and in Philippians about Epaphroditus, my fellow soldier. People could win and they could be in the battle with them. If you look at the cross like a battlefield, and it was, there was no one there, no armor bearer. There was no cavalry there with them. There was no infantry. There were no soldiers. There were no spearmen. The Lord Jesus was all alone. He was facing the wrath of God without the help, without the defense of anyone else. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. But Paul, perhaps the biggest group he talked about, he often wrote in his letters about, for example, Priscilla and Aquila, a couple, Urbanus, Timothy, Philemon, Justice, Clem Clement. And then he went on to say, and the rest of my fellow workers. In other words, in the task and the mission that he had, there was a whole team of people. And they all had different roles and responsibilities. And But they all worked together to bring about the, 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 the completion of God's plan and God's purpose and God's work. Come with me now to the Lord Jesus. You remember that when he sent out the 12 people, the 12 disciples, how did he send them out? Two by two. And when he sent out the group of 70 or 72, he sent them out dual, dual, two by two. But when it came to the, the aloneness of the cross, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Peter wrote, he, his own self, he all by himself bore our sin and his own body on the tree. The aloneness. He had nobody to help him. There was no none. He looked for comforters, and, and, and there were none. And for sympathy, for them to take pity, and, and there were none. And for comforters, and he found none. There was no one there. There was nobody to share in his experience. Nobody that could identify with it. Nobody to lend a hand, to give a comforting word, just to even give one of those looks like, I, I know what you're going through. He said, thy wrath lieth hard upon me. Remember the picture? One little goat. And all the sin being transferred to that goat in that illustration, in that figure, with all the weight of that big man. Come with me to the cross, the awfulness and the aloneness of the cross. When my beloved Savior, all alone, the wrath of God descended upon him like an avalanche. And no one helped, and no one could give sympathy, no one could give a word of comfort, no one could share in the burden. He would bear it. Alone, we sing sometimes, alone, alone. He bore it all alone. My friend, there is absolutely no need for you to go out into eternity bearing your sin. The great responsibility for your offenses against God. 
because I am here to tell you tonight once again that there was a man called Jesus. He went to the cross at a place called Calvary outside of the city of Jerusalem. And on that cross, he looked towards heaven, his arms open wide and the darkness of that experience. And he said to his God, thy wrath lieth hard upon me. That brings me to the close of my message. The answer of the cross. Why? Why would he do something like that? He didn't need to go through that awful, that awfulness of the cross. He didn't need to go through the aloneness of the cross, experiencing God's anger at the cross. He didn't do that to try and help you so you could get saved, as if you're a good person with a few problem sins in your life, and, and he took care of that part and that with your goodness, and somehow you have a deal, and God will save you. It's not that he looks at you and he says, you know, you're a person who believes. You're a believer. You have a lot of faith. And so he says, well, I'll take care of the sin. You do the other part. He didn't supply what you were lacking. He wasn't there as a supplier. He wasn't there as an example. He was there as a substitute. Have you ever thought that if you were under the wrath of God, that God would be right and that you deserve that? If you experience the awfulness of the wrath of God, that that would be fair for your sin against God? Have you considered the reality that you should be alone for all eternity, bearing your sins under the wrath of God? It would be reasonable. It would be right if God were to put you in that place, even tonight. You would be able to look up and say you wouldn't because you'd be angry. You still wouldn't face the reality. Thy wrath lying hard upon me. But there's no need for that. The answer to your problem is found at the cross. It's found in the Lord Jesus. That's why the Bible says, he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. That person has everlasting life now in this life and has it forever. They're going to heaven. But if you refuse, whosoever refuseth, whosoever believeth not, the Son of God shall not see that life. You'll never be in heaven. And the wrath of God lieth upon you. In other words, tonight, you are called upon by God to make to respond to what his son did at the cross that so many years ago. Who, when he absorbed the wrath of God, God says, what do you think of that? I ask you, what do you think of that? Do you find the answer to your problem? That's what we're praying for tonight. That's what we're longing for. That you'll come to understand, like I did the night that I got saved. I should have been there under the wrath of God. But Christ also has once suffered for sins. The just for the unjust. He took my place. He took the wrath that I deserve. Oh, that you would take it personally. What he did on the cross. And that you too will have everlasting life. That you won't refuse it any longer. That you will believe in the Son of God and see life and have life and never come under the wrath of God. Those who are saved, we rejoice. We can say there is now no condemnation. There is no wrath left for us who have been saved. It's great. We highly recommend it to you. Re recommend it to you. You need it tonight. Salvation is in Christ who said upon that cross under all the awfulness and the aloneness at the cross, as God's wrath descended upon him, said, Thy wrath, O God, thy wrath lieth hard upon me, fell on him, so I could be saved. What about you?